and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Go to the next slide. All we're going to do is change the background on this. And I want you to see this. We're just going to change the background. Click it one more time. And all I did is change the background and I put a black background. And what it is, is this is the lens that some of us read it through. We do. What we do is we stick with that first part. And the first part teaches us something about people. Because the Old Testament isn't just there and there's stuff there and there. Well, it really doesn't matter. It teaches us more about the reality of who we are when the New Testament teaches us the reality of who we can be. And we learn that through this, that the whole point of there ever being a get, or a certificate of divorce, or a divorcement, or whatever you call it, an annulment, we have hundreds of words for this. The only reason it existed is because of the hardness of heart. But yet if we change this, one more time, we're going to get what other people read from this verse. We're going to see, we put it on a purple background, change our lens slightly. We see this, this hard teaching of Christ that boils down to, they are two, they don't become one. This teaching is one of those that we have tried to make really difficult because if we make it difficult, it actually is easier to try to deal with. But the truth is, if we don't make it difficult, because this is what he says, the two become one. You can't really fix it at that point. Divorce doesn't do anything. This is why this is interesting, because he says this, and he talks about this adultery concept. He will go on to tell his disciples this adultery concept. And I want you to get, it's all going to come back to this. These two different teachings. One is people have hard hearts. Don't forget that. Number two, you need to get this, that the two become one flesh. And what God has joined together, man's not going to be able to separate. Let's continue in verse 10 and see this. And in the house, the disciples asked him about this matter. And he said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Adultery. What's adultery? Adultery is when you're married and cheat on your spouse. Adultery is when you're in a marriage relationship, you can commit adultery. You can't commit adultery if you don't have a spouse. You can't commit adultery if you're not in a marriage. And that's where this whole point comes from. Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. Because what did he say before? He said, the two become one flesh and nobody can separate it. He says, you give her a get. It doesn't count. A pronouncement of divorce doesn't count. The reason I say get is that's the word we're actually dealing with. When Moses said you could give her a divorcement, it was because they had hearts. But Jesus teaches a step farther and he says, but it doesn't actually work. It's not like you give a divorce and instantly you're two separate people. You've never been brought together. God didn't do a joining that is beyond any ceremony, any paperwork, any anything. No. He says they're married. You, you wrote a neat piece of paper. You wrote a piece of paper and you said some stuff. And that is all you've committed. You wrote some neat paperwork. And he continues this, let's read this. And they were bringing children to him, that they might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child, 
shout out into it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Mark has a trick, and Mark is not in order. If you think so, go read Matthew. It'll explain to you Mark is not in order. And what he does is he puts things together that just need to be put together. Why in the world would he talk about divorce and then jump over to children? Because we are so convinced that we can trap our sins in our own little bubble and it'll be in our life and it doesn't affect anyone around us. And we are convinced that we can have our issues and it's my issue. What is that to you? But when we bring in children, we understand something that just twists this whole thing around. There's somebody else involved in this now. It's not just a man and a woman not getting along or having a hard heart. It's a matter of, what about the children? What about these children who belong to the kingdom of heaven? Who look at their father... And are supposed to understand what a father is like so they can understand what our father is like. We are supposed to see marriage and understand the relationship of Christ and his church. And this is supposed to teach. And here's the issue. I have gone all over this and I want you to know what I did. I want you to know this. I'm not going to tear you. This is intentional all the whole time. What did I do? I ignored half that passage. I hope you'll notice. I ignored half of it, didn't I? I preached on how terrible and everything is when it comes to divorce. And I ignored something. I ignored... There's another picture. The other picture was this. We live in a world of hardened hearts. We live in a world where people cheat. We live in a world where the most dangerous position may be to remain someone's spouse. We live in a world that, honestly, isn't as simple as just cutting it down to the second piece of that scripture and saying, divorce is terrible, it's the worst thing in the world, you're an evil person because you're divorced. How many people get a divorce? One or the other. And... If your husband leaves you, which the Bible reading talked about, try to live at peace with him. What? So, so this hard teaching that I, I tried to express, the boiling down and just the, the two becoming one flesh and the beauty that's in it and the fact that it should teach us about so much more. And the, this marriage and this family teaches us about God and his church and all this. And instantly our thought can get so stuck on that that we look at those. The divorced. The hushed terms. Divorced. And we forget why Moses gave it. But Jesus says why he gave it. Because we live in a very fallen world. And even if we get most of this picture, I want you to understand that this is what I started with, and I won't get there. But I want you to understand I was starting over there just so I could. Because the truth is, marriage should be held as as sacred as Christ holds it. And honestly, he puts a very big standard on marriage. He doesn't talk about divorce because he doesn't recognize it. And we can stop there and say, well, okay, well, I've got my one pet scripture. I'm going to just stick with that. Or we can realize that there's more in that context. That there's more going on. And we can say, there's hardness of hearts. And we sometimes look at God and we go, yeah, you gave us your word. You don't understand what it's like here. God, you, you've given us a commandment, but you don't understand how hard it is here. And Jesus makes it clear that even in the Old Testament where God was often seen as this tyrant, He gives them something because He understands what it's really like. And it's not this single image 
where we get to go out and beat people over the head with it. Very little scripture is designed for you to beat someone over the head with. It's made of paper. Even if you combine it in a book like this, it's not that good a weapon. It, it, it's, a, it's a sword. A spiritual sword, though. It, it's not meant to be a sword that's a physical sword where you go beat people with it. It's not meant to be one of those where you attack everyone and assume you know everything about the situation. Because Scripture is very clear. There are different situations. There are different ways you could wind up in this situation. And that's why it's important to see the words of Christ and the later teachings where the apostles are explaining things to us. And when we put them together and we understand something, you shouldn't get divorced. And, and divorce should be treated with a sense of repentance and a recognition of how bad it is. But we can't take it to the further and extreme and go, well, there's no situation for divorce. I'm sorry. 1 Corinthians 7. Go read it. It actually gives specific reasons. If your spouse decides to leave you, they're a non-Christian. Let it be. Let them go. Never. Let them go. And if we ever forget that the law isn't like our New Testament. Where it's just something where we're looking to put somebody to death for this sin or this sin and that's adultery and that, that, that. But we're understanding that there's a love in the middle of this story. I mean, can, do you ever look at the law and go, oh, that's so loving. Moses is the most loving man I've ever met. A sorcerer shall not live. They shall be put to death by them. No one shall be put to death except by the witness of two, two or three. Do not mix them up in meat. Yeah, I got a little bit of that. And the truth is that Jesus is saying that because of their hardness of hearts, there was something that needed to be done. Because you know what? We live in a real world. And does Jesus want us to live in a world of divorce? No. He wants us to live in a world where there's no divorce and people are married forever. And the children are blessed through this and they can look to marriage and they can go, that's what the church and Christ look like. That's what that father who actually stayed around because he's a decent human being is reflecting God. And the fact that God in the Old Testament gave them this tells you more about men than anything. There are situations where it's probably best not to be in that relationship. That's only what Scripture suggests. And to look at this and say, well, I've got a perfect marriage. I mean, honestly, I am so spoiled. I am. You've met my wife. She's nuts. I only say that of reflection. She puts up with me. <coughs> Has she ever thought of divorcing me? I think most weeks, but... <laughs> but I understand something. I do. I can't control her. You, you're, if you're married, you understand this. You can't control your spouse. You really can't. If one they decide you are a worthless piece of dirt and they leave, what are you going to do? Are you honestly going to say, well, you know what? You should have known better. You should have predicted them. You should have read their heart and understood that the person you married was going to do this. I don't know what I'm going to do in five minutes. Which most of my wife is going to do in five minutes. And I'm supposed to tell you what she's going to think in the next 20 years if I live that long. The truth is, no. We live in a real world. In a real world of the cross, it says that God has a perfect plan for us. And His perfect plan is that marriage is holy. Marriage certificates, I think, are a joke. And most of you all know that. That piece of paper you sign, I think, is funny. In West Virginia, you don't even sign it. I like that. You just, I sign my name and y'all just, you know, I don't know. I don't think y'all do anything. And I think those pieces of paper are dumb. 
I think the service um, is done uh, for somebody else. I think the service is done. Because the service makes it about two people. And it's not. Marriage was never meant to be about two people doing something. It was about God doing something with two people. He is the chess master. He moves the pieces. Those two become one, and you know what? They just can't figure it out. I don't know how that works. I have no idea how marriage works, and I, I don't even care. I think it's awesome, beautiful, mysterious, and I love it. But it's something that God does. And so when, when we teach on divorce and remarriage, the important thing is that we remember both things. That we live in a fallen world. A world that needs love in spite of our sin. A world that things happen. But we also need to understand that God's way is perfect. And anytime we make anything holy into something common, we need to be repentant of it. We, we need to. When any time a marriage is dissolved, it's not a matter of, oh, it's just something. It's paper. It's something where you've taken something holy and it's become something calm. And no matter which lens you see through, because some of us, like me, are spoiled. I'm spoiled. If she was a normal woman, she would have left me when she figured out I was crazy. You know we moved like ten times just because I'm like, ah, it's Tuesday, we should move. I want to go to a different state. This one's dry. This one's too wet. This one's cold. And, and I'm spoiled by that. And it matters that and making somebody's Christianity about somebody else is, is a really big stretch. Because some of us got really lucky. Some of us didn't. There are people who didn't get lucky when they got married. And I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of situations, and the main reason that the Jews have said that divorce was allowed from the beginning was this. Men were beating their wives to death. That way they could go get a new one. Because nobody's going to protect a woman in Jewish society. Oops. And we always talk about that. Oh, that's new. That is not new. There is nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes said there is nothing new under the sun. So if you think there's something new, we're just wrong. And, and today we have that. I mean, there's just as much spousal abuse as anything. Just as much cheating people. There's just as much anything as they had already dealt with. And the truth is that God was not blind. It wasn't that God didn't understand. It's that God has a perfect will for us. And the second we say, oh, you messed up in that area where I didn't mess up. I mean, for reading through a specific lens. I got plenty of sins I get to confess. And I say get intentionally. I get to confess. Because I got a God who, it doesn't matter which sin, I'm confessing. I get to confess. I get to take anything. I get to take. I could be the terrible person that caused the divorce. And you know what? I get to confess it. Today we have an invitation. An invitation that more says who God is than who we are. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. It's God's power. God offers that same forgiveness that He has offered over and over because of His Son, because of His love, because of His greatness. And today we have the opportunity to respond to Him initially, to come to Him believing who He is. 
repenting of our sins, knowing that we can confess any of our sins to Him. So that we can confess Him as Lord, be buried with Him in baptism, so that He, by the glory of the Father, brings us into a new life. So that we can live for Him. We have that invitation, but we have the invitation to have the church pray for us if something's weighing too much on us. And we're having trouble giving it to God. Or if there's anyone here who wishes to submit to the eldership here. All these are open as we stand and as we sing. Wonderful story.